a, a background to um, sort of criminal activity in, in, in your era when you first came in in, in the 80s? What was going on? Basically, most villains were earning their money at, on the pavement, what we call going on the pavement, which is armed robbery or protection, rackets, violence, robbing other criminals. But uh, around about, they were dishing out such, so much heavy bird uh, during the mid-80s. They were using the supergrass system. A lot of armed robbers got caught and got put away down to supergrasses. And they were the dishing out 25 year recommended, recommended sentences. So people looking at that, us coming up, although we did get involved on the pavement, we, t we, we knew that there was no future in it. It was a mugs game. Uh, puff started to be smuggled into the country. When I say puff, I mean hashish, all from mostly from North Africa. Would come from North Africa through Spain, through Holland, into this, into this, into England. So um, there, then we saw how much money there was to be earned in the puff game. So the plan was, if you had a bit of work on the pavement where you got say 250 or 300 grand or more, anything up to a mil, then you would invest that into other businesses that are going to bring you more money. So basically, we moved into the puff game by, we, we done it by actually fucking other main, main line drug dealers, main uh, big drug dealers at the time. So what would happen was we'd find out about their loads when they were coming in and we'd hijack them. So one load we took off of uh, one character called The Bug, who was a major league player at the time. I th we took, we, we carved up about 1.5 mil off of his load. All we'd done was wait, we knew when his transport was coming in because we had the driver, we knew the driver. And uh, we, when, when, when it came into the warehouse, we just went in, laid the driver and his boys down, you know, with guns, laid them down, wrapped them up, and then just drove his lorry away with the gear. So there we walked away for about two hours work, we had about 1.5 mil. Well, it's a lot of money today, but go back to like 1985, that, that's, that's a real big amount of money. So then we would want to invest that into other businesses so that we had a regular income. We, would, we invested in prostitution in Soho, uh, porn, which was illegal at the time. Uh, and we also, we were, we were running protection rackets, but now all of a sudden we've got large amounts of dough coming in uh, from Puff, from you know, robbing other villains from their drugs. Plus we were making, putting our own feelers out and getting our own transport and making our own contacts to bring in our own loads as well. But we would, uh, where we were drawing protection money from pubs and clubs, all of a sudden, we, had, we, were like, we would go into someone who had a freehold pub. We would draw in, say, 500 a week, and we'd sit down with them. We'd say, we want to have a chat with you. We'd say, this is all very nice, but uh, we want a piece of the freehold now. We've got the money. And we, we called it, the strategy we called it was with the bag, we called it a bullet or the bag of money. What one do you want to take? I mean, we're sitting there, our firm were four-handed. We were well-respected and feared in the area. So we would just say, listen, we want to buy half the freehold. We want to buy you out completely. What do you want to take? You've got the choice. Bag of money or a bullet. What are you going to take? I mean, Terry Smith talked about when he came out of prison, going from, you know, like, I can't remember how many years it was, but he talks about that when he got back on the streets, he saw all these guys all of a sudden riding around in nice, smart cars, dressed in nice clothes, whereas, you know, whereas before you went in, even armed robbers didn't earn that much money. And he said this was all from the, he realised this was all from the drug street. That's right. Armed robbers really never earned that much money. They sweated, uh, you know, sweated on, on a low, uh, sweated on a piece of work. If, if they were lucky, they, they might have carved up 20 or 30 grand a piece, but they never knew what to do with it. You know, uh, we were the first uh, I think really, apart from one or two characters that are probably well known in British gangland history that have earned money, we were probably the first generation that pulled out of doing, going on the pavement, moved away from protection as such and moved into the, uh, the, the drugs game. That's where everyone who was anyone earned their money in the 80s and you became untouchable financially. Well, tell me also about the police then, and how come the police didn't get, get a hold of you at that stage? Well, you see, what happened was, the police got to be very lucky to catch you anyway. I mean, uh, and if you can, if you put up a bit of work and you get away with it, and then you inv invest that into other illegal activities where you're not on offer so much and the bird is not as big, like if you go out on the pavement with guns, 
and you get f flopped on by the cops, then straight away you're, you're caught, you're banged to rights, you're banged up, you're looking at 25 years. Whereas with drugs, you use front man system, uh, front man system. so you can have Fred Blog, you can have, you have four or five different people in front before you even get anywhere near the drugs. You don't touch them, okay? You'll slip out, you'll do the deal. You'll slip out to Spain or you'll slip out to North Africa, you do the deal. Then you have people that you pay to go load up you have your lot, dry, lorry, which has been converted to bring the gear in, so you don't touch it. All you do is put your name to it and you, to make sure that you get paid, that no one's going to fuck you the other end for your money. So if they, if, when the old Bill were nicking people, but they're only nicking the donkeys. We were sitting pretty. What did that change about then, about the way the, the police react? I'm presuming you're getting more sophisticated, there's more money around, therefore you can be more devious in the way that you're going about your business, so it's not quite so... Easy as a policeman stumbling across a, 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 an armed robbery, right? Yeah, or hearing about there's a bit of work or going down. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we were virtually untouchable. I mean, as to this day, all of my firm, including myself, I mean, I've been convicted of uh, only relatively minor offences, and uh, all of my firm have got away literally with murder and attempted murders and also from bringing drugs in. I mean, because once you distance yourself from a crime, it's very hard for the old bill, to, unless they catch you bang to rights, they can't do anything. It's changed now because they've brought in a new system of, of tracing money, but go back to the mid eighties, they weren't so sophisticated. I think since the, this trouble in Ireland dried up and they, se they sequestered a lot of like the MI5, MI6 people into the, into the, uh, the old bill, then they've sort of got their act together with major league drug dealers. But before that, they didn't have a clue. And presumably, like any new business, they didn't quite know how to react to this new business on the street, right? They didn't know what was happening. No, no, the old bill didn't have a clue. I mean, literally, they were trying to get us for protection and stuff like that. So they would go into, when I got nicked for an for for armed robbery by the uh, organised crime squad, and uh, they tried to trace accounts because we had offshore accounts and stuff like that out in Guernsey and Jersey, the Isle of Man and Gibraltar. But they, at that time, they didn't really know what they were doing. They were more interested in getting us for the violence and getting us for gangland, related gangland killings or whatever. The that was, stuff, anyway. Yeah. I mean, they hadn't really sort of caught up with the te technology like they have now, traces on bank accounts and bugging and all that sort of thing. And, and what does that mean then for the changing nature of organisation, if you're sort of like doing an armed robbery and you're doing it in the, in the 60s and you've got certain people and then you're talking about the, the sort of organisations you were involved in, well, how, how did the structure of these things change? Well, I mean, when, when people say villains and villainy and, and, and uh, armed robbers, they're really talking about just little groups of unorganised people going out and earning some money, going out and spending it on holidays. But what we done, we basically made contacts with other proper firms. I mean, we, you would look that, by like late 80s, you'd look down, anyone who was working the pavement, you'd say they were a mug, because that wasn't the way to go. And we forged ties with various, like if you want to, for want of a better word, you can call them crime families in different parts of London, in the north, in the south, who we all of them were bringing in drugs. Uh, the only trouble was, what happened was there was no honour among thieves. It was really dog fuck dog. And that's when there was lots of violence. I don't know if you remember, but there was lots of gangland killings in the 80s because the temptation was too much. You know, you'd have a load come in and you'd be sitting there. You've got two million pounds in readies. Now, what do you do? You're four handed and you're supposed to weigh off oh, to, to that lot over North London. And you're sitting there and it's just not in your mentality to, would you say, oh, fuck them, we've got the money. Let them do what they want to do. So it started off as like gangs or groups of people sort of like saying that they wouldn't do business with each other. And yeah. Actually, but the reality was very different. Well, the that. reality was that you're talking about uneducated men that are motivated by the thrill of crime and greed. And there's no way that you're going to, once you've got that there, you're going to dish it out. Even armed robbers were notoriously known when they had a bag, when they, they call it taking the bag. Everyone knows that if you had four armed robbers, they've got the bag, one person has got the snatch, yeah, on the van, and they, he takes the money, and he counts it out. Everyone knows that he never gives a straight amount to his pals who he's just been on the pavement with. Very few people did. 
when, when we now that we think of sort of drug gangs, I, I think, I mean, this is wrong, but when you think of like black guys, Yardies. Low level, very low level. I mean, they've never been able to organise. Very, I mean, these kids are killing each other for bags of skag and for 1,500 quid. I mean, today they're killing each other for two grand and they're, doing, they're sniffing up coke and they're, they're pulling guns out of windows and, and firing spray, you know, what we were doing. We were, we were fucking people that was as dangerous as us out of their drugs and plotting them up. If, had to, if they had to be taken out of the game, as it were, plotting them up, I mean, sober. And if any fool can take a line of coke and put a gun out a window and shoot into a crowd of people, but to be sober and then go and plot up another firm and take their money, it's a different, we would, that's, they're just like, if you, if you want to put it succinctly, we're Premier, we were Premier League and they were Hackney Marshes. So when the Yardies came... Well, Yardies, there's no such thing as Yardies. Tell, 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 tell me about that. Yeah. Yeah, but you see, this thing about yardies, it's a fallacy. Right. I mean, I knew a few guys from Jamaica. They'd come and try and do business with them. We'd fuck them off because they were just so petty and so low level that you wouldn't want to be doing business with them. See, this thing about yardies, it, it, it's bullshit. It's a concoction by old Bill to say that there's these Jamaican black Jamaican gangs when they're just guys, individuals that are just ripping each other off for bags of crack and stuff like that. I mean, as far as making inroads in organised crime, never, not in any way, shape or form. We had one trouble with one yardie once. This was a famous yardie called Rankin Dread. And uh, I think he's dead now, he died of AIDS. And we, at the time, we had into Moody Sauna business. And uh, I mean, the guy was a scumbag. He, he had a couple of birds that were on the game and he would keep coming up into the sauna and taking money off them. And this guy was the head of the yardies. I mean, we just waited for him one night and he came up to the stairs. She said, you're ranking dread. He's like, yeah. So we were like four-handed there, just put a gun up his mouth, you know, well, basically up into his nose, just said, fuck off, you know? I mean, and that was it. Never saw no more of him. And he was the head man at the Yardies, or supposedly the Yardies. So I think that's all blown out of proportion. So, so the groups you're talking about, let's go straight there, they're, they're, they're white, they're white right? All white, and you're talking, very few uh, would, we wouldn't deal with um, anyone that was black for just so reason that we wouldn't know them. In South London, there was probably a little bit more, but uh, most, but my gang, they were pretty racist. I, I'm not racist, but they were. But the old East London, North London, West London gangs wouldn't really have anything to do with um, blacks, full stop. They were, they were white, they were white. All white, and yeah, you wouldn't, you might, you just wouldn't have anything to do with them. I mean, I don't know if it's changed now, but I mean, that was up till just a few years ago, no. Very close knit. So you're talking a firm of us, which was our firm of four people. Not, we wouldn't let anyone near us. That's why we never got nicked. So if someone came to someone that they had a deal or this was gonna go down, they would be kept at arm's length. They would never meet us. The deal would be done through the person that was the introduction. So if anything went down, he's the one that's gonna get nicked or he's the one that's gonna get taken out of the game if anything goes wrong. Nothing's going to come back to us. I mean, it's interesting just because, well, you know, because I stopped making this programme there, you know, boring middle-class idiots that know nothing. So when we read the... Well, actually, you're the sensible ones, well, and we're the fools for well, getting involved in crime. Well, we, we read the cuttings, as we have done. They're, they're always like, you know, yardy gangs, the Tamil gangs. The well, but it, and none of them say anything about these white books that run this whole thing. Right, right. And it is true, though, isn't it? The vast majority of sort of criminal and criminal activities is done by white blokes. Yes, it is. Us. Well, I mean, on a higher level, pulling the, pulling the strings, yeah. I mean, low-level sort of crack selling is probably predominantly maybe black crime. I don't know. But behind, bringing in the, co the, well, the Charlie, the cocaine, and operating right at the top, if you like, the CEOs, yeah, they're, they're white, of course. I mean, how many... When you see these guys get arrested that are so-called yardies... They're, they're, they're busted in a council flat. How many, how many yardies, or so-called yardies, have been busted in a, in a mansion out in Essex, a five million pound mansion? None. They, okay, they've got, over, they, they, they've got like council houses that are probably over furnished and they've got plenty of gold jewelry and they've got a Mercedes, but I mean, what's that? You know? When, 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 when you were doing your activities, did you think of it as, as like a, a business? Do you think of it as, a, as legitimate? Do you think of it as just, how do you sort of like think of it in your head? 
you don't think of it. It's just part of you. I grew up committing crimes from when I was a kid. You don't think anything. It's every, all you do is every day, you just want another deal. Because not even for the money, it's being involved in deals. You know, every day we were scheming to, to fuck someone or to rob someone, or you know, someone would come to someone with a, what we would call, it's called a coup, of any coups about, would go to meet at one, like in our, in our firm, two of, two of the guys had t two or three car fronts. So we'd go there and sit there, and people would come to the car front and talk, you know, oh, I heard so has got a bit of business. And we would just want to, you just want to be involved because that's, you, that's your reason of living. You know, that's how you get your buzz. That's like, it's like a footballer. He's got to, he doesn't want to sit on the bench every week, even though he's getting 100 grand a week. He wants to be out on the field playing. That's how, you, you just want that buzz. You, you, you enjoy hurting people. You enjoy fucking people. And the money's a side issue. The money's great. But after you've made X amount of money, you're comfortable. It's not really about the money. It's the, it, you, you just want to, you just love it. You're just wrapped up in the whole, you know, you make a phone call to a club and you walk in there, you don't pay, you get the best seat in the house. Wherever you go, what, what restaurant, you get the best seats in the restaurant. You know, everyone gives you this sort of like fake to respect. It's respect through fear. But, you know, you're living a rock and roll lifestyle. You can hardly read on right, but you're living like a rock star. So that's how you feel at the time. Of course, it comes back and bites you in the ass because you can't retire from the game. All these people that say they're retired, you know, if you're a proper villain, you can never retire because you've made too many en enemies. Uh, I know, you, you know you've, written, you've written a book, and I've read some reviews of the book, and I've read what's in it, but is that why, why are you you're not showing your, I mean, are you, can you not retire? Is that why you're- Oh, I can never retire. I can never, I mean, Joe Public can answer the front door. If there's a knock on, I can never ever do that, you know, I regret that. So Joe Public, if there's a knock on his door, he can open the latch up and say, yeah, can I help you? I can never, ever, ever, for as long as I live, answer my front door. Just explain for us the benefit. Well, because, because there could be someone, no one's going to be standing there with a briefcase full of money for me. The only thing I'm going to get is a bullet. Because I, I, I pulled away from gangland lifestyle, I turned my back on the violence. It was the violence, really. It just became too much. It was like the violence was needless. People feared us. We could have what we wanted. We had money. We had everything you wanted. But one of the firm, I don't know if he's, he, I would say he's a psychopath. I'm not a doctor. But he just wanted to keep on hurting people. And he, he, he wanted to kill people for the slightest dis, uh, dis show of disrespect. Or for any reason, he wanted to take people out of the game. He wanted to hurt people. And in the end, I was doing a lot of coke, you know, I had money coming out of my ears, and I just thought, I don't need this anymore. So I just wanted to pull out, and I wrote a book about it, and of course, yeah, I'm a marked man. I've already had two or three attempts on my life. The closest came when I came out of a pub in East London before I went to, to, the, to America, and my partner, who was one, well, one, of my, one of the firm, come off the back of a bike and pulled a shotgun out and fired it, and it clicked. It just didn't fire, literally three or four feet away from me. I wasn't carrying a gun at the time. I had it on my toes, I'm not ashamed to say. I legged it, what else could I do? And there's been two or three occasions where I've nearly lost my life. That's, uh, you never can retire. You know, and that's just from my firm I've upset. There's people that we've fucked. One day, I don't think any of my old firm are gonna make old bones. We're all gonna end up, they'll either end up nicked, because they're still operating. They bring, they do, they're in coke, involved in the coke business. They'll end up with one in the back of the head, same as I probably will. And if that's how I've got to go, that's how I would prefer it. Just one, cause someone come up behind me one day when I'm getting into a car and just put one in the back of my nut. I don't want to be taken away and tortured, because I've taken people away and tortured them. And that's not nice. Tell me about um, when you're, like, the idea of the so-called firm or a gang or something. Well, you would call it a firm. It wouldn't. What's the difference between a gang and a firm? Well, we just wouldn't call it a gang. I mean, that sort of sounds like the Bay City Rollers. I mean, it how would... do you choose members of your firm, or how do you become involved? You you involved? don't. What happens is you see. I had a name. I, w I was working for a family in South London. You know, I was like collecting some debts for them for people that didn't pay them, bashing them up. 
and then you know and you just get known in the area that you're reliable and then you meet other people then I, I, I moved into the West End and I, I was involved with a character called Bernie Silver who was who was known as the godfather of Soho now he was serving life imprisonment for the murder of a uh, he, it was the biggest, he was involved in the biggest corruption case of the old bill in this country, uh, it, involving a commander, Commander Ron Moody. But he was also serving life for the murder of Tommy Scarface Smitherson. He was having problems with Maltese in the Soho drinking clubs that he owned and also in the strip joints. They weren't paying him on, they weren't paying his rent while he was inside, he was lifed off. He approached, he heard about me that, you know, that I you know, could handle myself and stuff like that and knew that you know, I carried guns and didn't really give a fuck for anyone. And he recruited me and another f couple of fellas to just go and sort out some grief for him in Soho. So I went into Soho, we went into, there was a couple of Maltese drinking clubs, we walked in there, found the fellas, like, pulled out guns, just put it in their faces, said, listen, you're out of that place, you're out of that place there, you're out of that place there, now, you know, fuck off. A couple of people we had to hurt, with one guy got thrown out of a window, smashed to pieces with hammers. And next thing you know, Bernie Silver from inside prison said to me, you know, whatever you want to take out of that, you can have. So next thing you know, I'm earning a lot of money out of, out of Soho. I mix, then all of a sudden, I start drinking in Canning Town and I mix with villains in Canning Town. So we say, well, you know, I'm earning money here, you're earning money there, let's get together, you know. And that's how allegiances are formed. Allegiances are formed by um, your reputation. People know that you've been nicked. I'd been nicked a few times on serious charges, kept them, never opened my mouth, never said anything to anyone. So that word gets around. When I was, was introduced to people from Canning Town, I had the, the same reputation there. The, one, one of the guys had just been done for murder, would been 18 months, A category prisoner, remand, got not guilty. So, you know, you've got, you've got that sort of reputation and you know that each other, you can form a solid bond and you're not going to get nicked. Because the last thing you want is, if four of you are nicked by the heavy mob, you don't want to be sitting there thinking, fuck, I hope they're going to keep their mouth shut, otherwise I'm down the swanny for 25 years. See, once you don't have that worry, what worry do you have? Because old Bill can't get you. Trust is important. Well, it's, it's everything in the respect of getting nicked. But within that... About the, the, the future then, we, you know, we've gone beyond drugs now, we know well, there's people trafficking, there's forgery, there's even international terrorism, who knows, I mean, uh, what's your view on, on how firms, criminal networks, however you want to call them, are, are going to operate in the, in the, in the next sort of like 20 years or so? I think it's getting more difficult for them. If you look at the last uh, armed robberies that have happened, they've been very amateur. There have been people that probably just knew someone who knew someone who worked there and they've, they've nicked, the, nicked the load and they've got caught a few weeks later. The big boys now are still involved in drugs. The money's gone out of the puff game. A lot of people are growing at home. Plus they, they're growing skunk now. So that the, what we used to call, what we used to smuggle was solids. That's what you brought in, that was hashish. The, the, the bottom's fallen out of that market. Ecstasy market, the, the, the bottom's fallen out of. You can buy ecstasy now for two pound a tab. So there's no money in that. The coke, is going to be probably still going to be a problem with coke. I think you're going to see a lot of people getting killed over coke. There's still a lot of money in that. But I think anyone that's made their money is going to be very wary because of the confiscation laws now. Now, that's the thing that's going to get people. Explain what those confiscation laws are. Well, to what I understand, they were brought in in the Irish Republic to deal with um, the IRA. And uh, I think they've been brought in over here now. And what that says that if you can't account, from my understanding, is that if you can't account for what you've got around you, we'll take every, they're going to take everything from you. Even if it's your wife, in the name of your wife? Yeah, I don't think that matters anymore. I think that if you can't show how you've got your money, you know, and you're living in a, in a, in a five million pound house, then to have the thought of that taken away from you, I think that's, it's quite a deterrent in the respect that, if, if you're 50 years old and you've got to go back and, that, and you get everything taken off you and you've got to go back, see, you, you must remember that to get to that five million pound house, you've, you've earned your money, what we call on the plot, which would be in the 
the inner city areas. That's where you've earned your money. You've, you've fucked people, you've, maybe you've killed them, you've hurt them, you've tortured them. You've made your money from those places to move out, okay? Now, if you're faced with the prospect of losing that big house and having to move back into that area at 50 years old, you're gonna last five minutes. Because people, when you're down, they're gonna say, I remember that cunt, what he done to us. We'll fuck him now. Yeah, nothing. You lost all your friends because you fucked everyone on the way up. So if you're on, on the way down, you're 50 years old, there's going to be someone who's going to say, yeah, I'll, I'll make my name by, I'll, ki I'll kill him. I'll make my name doing it, doing him. So I think that that is such a strong law. Because at the end of the day, that's what everyone wanted to aspire to, was the big house and move away from the plot. Anyone with any sense. No one made millions and stayed in their council houses. Only, only idiots. Only the mugs on the plot. You know, and now, you know, with Crime Watch and stuff like that, you know, if you're living in the street and all of a sudden you pull around in a brand new car, you're going to have all the neighbours in the street on the phone, that bastard, he's got a new car, phoning up Crime Watch. So I think that, that I, think, I think that it's going to, for the people that have made it, they're clear, they'll move into straight business and so you'll never catch them. But I, I think the confiscation laws is going to what, be what sort of tidies it up. It's not going to stop it. But I don't think that's the worry, is it? It's the low-level crime that people are worried about. You know, the crack dealing on the streets and all those people just Smart driving around yeah. and shooting, you know, 30 shots out of car windows and all that. When you talk about gangland violence and torturing people, I mean, I guess people might have an impression of what that, that is, but what, what, is, what is, really is it? I mean, what, what do you mean by torturing people? Well... What are you doing? Well, I'll give you one instance. Uh, we the, this the, the, you know one particular dealer. We knew that he'd come over. He only he used to live abroad, so he only came over here when the drugs had been sold. He came over to oversee the money. So the, the, the drugs had been sold, the money had been weighed on. So all he came over for was to make sure that the money was there to be put into car panels, and then driven across into Spain where he lived. And we knew this. Uh, so w one day, we just, uh, we, we had someone in the inside. They said, next time he comes over, we know that he's gonna be sitting on between three and five mil. So we're gonna take him away. Now he's got a choice. He gives us the money or he ends up in the river. So when he came over, we got someone in the inside who made a meet. We said, make a meet with him at a car front on a, on a, on a phony pretense of business. Then we just went in four-handed just smashed him to bits there, rolled him up in a carpet and carried him out to a van, took him back to one of our boozers, rolled him into the cellar and then just tortured him until he, until he, came, until he told us where the money was. Because the money was parked in car parks, in cars. What they used to do, remember the old Citroens used to sit low? That's how, what, that was the, they used to put the money and stuff in those. So that, because once you fill a car up with money, whatever, it sinks. But with those, you wouldn't notice. So if old Bill went driving around looking at different cars parked on there, they'd be parked low anyway, because the suspension on them. So there was like five or six cars parked with, uh, there was about, we didn't get the whole lot because my, one, of the, one of the guys in our firm just went so mad and just smashed the guy up to pieces with a hammer that we, he nearly died. So but we got one, we had about 1.5 mil out of him. I mean, you can imagine the fear of being, t I don't, unless you've had it, unless you've been there and witnessed it, I don't think anyone can understand the fear of being kidnapped and tortured. It's not the way I'd want to go. As I say, hopefully, if I do get killed, it'll be with a bullet in the back of the head. But to take someone away and put them in a room, tied to a chair, with a cloth over their head, in darkness, knowing that, I mean, this guy, was begging us to kill him. He said, I can't stand it anymore. Please kill me. Please kill me. And, uh, basically hit by a hammer, you said. Well, that wasn't, well, no, I mean, basically hit with a hammer, then his head held into a bucket of water until he was drowning, then pulled out. Uh, then we put his hands out and my partner smashed his uh, uh, hands to pieces with a sledgehammer. I mean, the guy was fucked. He would never be the same again. No matter how much money he's got, he'll never be the same again. And that's, we've done that a few times, and that's not something I'm proud of.
When, when you talked about the sort of like the incompetence of some of the armed robberies you've seen that in, I mean, you refer to things like the Millennium Thermal. Do you know anything about that? That, that, that was a ready eye. Was that? I know. Well, that, that was a ready eye. That, a ready eye is when the cops know that it's going to happen. It was a ridiculous piece of work. A ridiculous piece of work. What, what were they going to do with the diamond? It was a ready eye. I believe that that was a setup. I, I honestly believe that that, that, was, uh, that was instigated because... Uh, let me put it this way, someone I think, someone went to someone with a deal and then I believe that someone on the inside then went to the old Bill and said, listen, these guys want to rob this thing. And I believe that the old Bill said, well, yeah, go on, let them go ahead because we want to make a good show. That's, that was a ready eye. So that, I, I believe that that was instigated behind the scenes by old Bill who wanted to make themselves look good and swoop on that. And uh, I've got that from a good source that that was a ready eye. Just a, just a fucking joke. I mean, it, it is, uh, that's, Peter, that's something out of Peter Sellers, trying to rob that. I mean, what the fuck were they going to do with it? Speedboats up the Thames, morons, you know. I mean, the, the, the whole idea of armed robbery is, is you've got to be, you know, you, you've got to know what you, you know, you want used readies. It's the same as the Brinks mat. See, I know the people on the Brinks mat, and I know the armed robbers on the Brinks mat. Now, when, they went, when, they, when that bit of work was first punted around, that was punted around to us. People came to us, because we were dealing with, with villains in South London, where that came from, and I knew one of the robbers on the bit of work. And they came to us and they said, listen, there's, there's 3.5 mil cash in, a, in a, 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 a shed at Heathrow. But everyone was talking about this bit of work. Everyone was talking about, yeah, we're gonna, they're going to take this. We said, no, we're not interested. They didn't even know about the gold. When they went there, they only wanted to nick the, what they should have done. If they'd have just nicked the reddies and left the gold, it wouldn't have come on top. But they didn't even have a van. They went back and got a van and nicked all the gold, and it came on top. So, I mean, these are not clever people, really. See, when, it, when the old Bill put it in, you've got to remember, see, old Bill has a close relationship with newspaper uh, crime reporters because they work they feed off each other so they always say well this is a really clever bit of work well they are going to say that because they're going to say these these villains were really clever because if they say they're stupid well people are going to say well yeah well if they're stupid it can't be that hard to catch them but if they say they're clever then well the old bill must be clever because they caught them you know what's clever about walking into a place with guns telling people to lay on the floor and then getting a load of money and running off and driving off in a van there's nothing clever about it. It's not like in the films where you see people come from ceilings and there's all these like uh, red lights and people, are, you know, it, that, I don't know anyone who's clever. You know, that's, you might, these people have done tunneling and stuff like that, but I mean, not London villains. You know, all you do, you run in, you put a gun to someone, tell them, lay down, you can't, I'll fucking shoot you. And then you run away with a bag of money. I mean, that's not really, you don't need to be Einstein to do that. Um, tell, tell me about the guns then. Did you see, Well, I mean, to be honest with you, there was always guns around. But, I mean, a lot of kids carry them as fashion accessories, don't they? A lot of black kids and all that, and they'll pull them out and wave them about. We used to just use them as on a need and when basis. So we would have safe houses, anyone's house, who we knew that was stum. They would have, we'd have three guns plotted up there, two guns plotted up there. I mean, we even had a, we had a tailor's in Soho there with floorboards, we had guns stuck under there. And see, if you got nicked with guns, first, if you got nicked with a sawn off, then you were gonna be nicked for conspiracy for armed robbery, yeah? If you got nicked, we wish the, we'd use like semi-automatics with silences. If you got nicked them, you was looking at a 10 stretch. So you really would wanna just use, if you're gonna use them, you'd use them, then get rid of them, okay? Once, if, if, if something had been, if a gun has killed someone, you can't put that gun back into circulation because sooner or later the, the, the forensics are going to find that and tail it back to anyone that's used it. I'm the last, when we fell out of a firm in South London, I carried a gun probably for the last three years that I was involved in crime. I carried a gun 24 hours a day because I knew that it could have come on me at any time and it did a couple of times. But, uh, and that's when I thought to myself, well, okay, when we needed guns, we went and got them and used them but now I'm carrying a gun full time. So sooner or later I'm gonna get stopped 
So there I'm looking at a 10 stretch straight away. I can't say, maybe, there has, maybe there's more guns about now, I don't know. But there's never been a shortage of them. I suppose there's a myth that there was never, never guns around beforehand. Mm. There was always guns. I mean, we didn't always, you, see, you've got to, see, the politics of crime is such that there's different weapons used for different purposes, okay? The gun, even with a criminal, is, can be a political statement within the criminal fraternity. Whereas someone, you might, you don't, say you like someone, but they've taken a liberty. They say, we like him, we don't really, we don't want to ruin him. It's like what the IRA do with punishment shootings. We'll, we'll just shoot him in the legs. So what you're doing, you're shoot, you've, you've done something, you've sent out a, a message to the local, all the local villains, listen, don't fuck, because will, we will come on you. But we didn't really hurt him, because all we've done was shot him in the kneecap, okay? Whereas if, you wanted, if, if someone took a real out and out liberty, then you would plot them up and you would beat them to death or they would get stabbed to death, you know? Or if a proper villain was gonna be taken out of the game, it'd be shot with a bullet in the head, which sent out another message to the community. So it wasn't just a question of, oh, you, we've got guns, you know, bang, bang, bang. There was, there's different codes and different people would warrant different things. Like someone who you consider a mug, but a liberty taker, they would just get a stripe down their face, what they call it a Glasgow smile. You would just cut him. Because that means that every day for the rest, you would cut him because you weren't worried about him. No, if, you, if, if I feared you, and I wouldn't cut you across the face, because I know that you, every day you look at that in the mirror, and your wife says, or your wife says to you every day, well, yeah, you beat me up and you ever got me. Well, why don't you go down and say it about the people that done that to your face? So a mug you would cut because you say, well, you're only a cunt, so I'll cut you across the face and now live with that for the rest of your life. You ain't going to do nothing. Someone who was dangerous, you'd approach them differently. Good. Done. Great. Thanks. Very good.